Hello and welcome to BB Book Buzz. Uh, this is our, what, May edition, and um, I'm here with Casey Trico, who's head of the youth department, and Jacqueline Powers, our assistant director, and I'm Karen Stern um, at the reference desk, and uh, we're here to help you find your next great read, as always. Um, just want to say the next month we have coming up uh, our big beach reads program, which is there's going to be more of us in front of the camera, and um, there will be lists of books at the library that you're going to be able to come and pick up um, on different themes that we all have chosen to talk to you about. So that'll be exciting for next month um, before we take a break for the summer. Um, and I'm going to start today with um, <clears throat> a book that is called, it's called True Biz by Sarah Novich. Um, and you could say that this is just another coming of age, teenage kind of coming of age story. Um, but there's a huge difference in that it's all set in the deaf community. Hmm. Um, so I, I kind of think I, I'm not going to, I don't want to read too, too much, but there's, there's, a, there's quotes at the beginning that she starts at the beginning of the book that kind of take you into the meat of the, of the book. And the first one is from Aristotle, who says, those who are born deaf all become senseless and incapable of reason. So that was Aristotle. Then there was Alexander Graham Bell in 1883, who basically said, those who believe as I do that the production of a defective race of human beings would be a great calamity to the world, will examine carefully the causes that lead to the intermarriages of the deaf with the object of applying a remedy. Lovely. Oh, wow. Okay. So yeah, <laughs> little did we know, right? And yeah. then the third one is, um, is actually from an NBC news program that ran in March of 2014. And it just says, a manufacturer of amazing medical devices known as cochlear implants, which restore hearing to the deaf, sold defective implants to young children and adults for years, even after learning that a significant number of the devices had failed. So those are the three quotes that launch us into mm -hmm. this book. Um, and you sort of start to realize, okay, this is, <laughs> this is more than just a story about a teenager. Um, and... Our teenager, the teenager in question is Charlie, and she is um, at the center of True Biz, and she is deaf, and she's late teens, I think. She's in high school, basically. Um, <clears throat> she has finally been allowed by her parents and the courts to go to attend a deaf school. Mm -hmm. um, she has been in the mainstream education because she has this cochlear implant, but hers is one of the ones that has failed. So she's had it since a small child, as, uh, and and it has never worked properly. And so she's mm -hmm. always struggled in school. She, her parents, and and this is the case. This is she sort of sets the scene, uses Charlie as a representative of many deaf children who with hearing parents, whose parents do not want them to learn ASL, American Sign Language, because um, they feel it will mark them as different or like it would be a cross somewhere. Like it, it's, something but like they, that to survive like, in the world that, they have to be able to and they don't want their children to look different they don't want their so and they think you know the, the idea is to fix them make them like hearing people by putting in these cochlear implants but these implants actually you know charlie has ser serious problems with them in the book does he, she does she know she can't they're not working correctly? yeah oh yeah oh, no, no, okay. she's, she's always she's trying known. to tell her parents that they that don't, they don't work what well, I mean they work she can hear some but right. it's really distorted it, it buzzes in her head it gives her headaches it's oh, not awful. it's yeah. horrible it's like a torture device in a lot of ways and she just you know so part of her teenage rebellion is rebelling against her parents who are um have forced this on her her mm -hmm. mother in particular her parents are actually getting a divorce at the beginning of the book over this issue because her mother will okay. not budge on this issue she will not mm -hmm. let her learn ASL and she doesn't want her to go to the deaf school, all of these things. She, she, she just wants to replace the cochlear implant and try to get it to work. Her father has kind of come around and is interested in, he starts taking ASL lessons with her before she goes to the school. So that's the sort of setup. Um, so, so she gives you one sort of view into the deaf community. I mean, what you, what you suddenly realize is there is just so much that we in the hearing community don't know. Um, and this book is really a wonderful way in, um, mm. a, along with being a great story and everything. So you get other characters who sort of represent other um, aspects of the deaf community. Um, there's the the woman who is, she's a hearing woman. Um, her name is um, February. Um, 
a long story behind that. But anyway, uh, she is her parents were both deaf, so she is a she's what they call coda, right? Child of deaf adult. Mm. You know the movie Coda mm -hmm. that has been really popular recently. That that's where that comes from, or that's where that word comes from. So she she leads the school that Charlie goes to, um, and she obviously is a bridge between. She's she's fluent in ASL because of her parents, and she's fluent in English. Um, so she is a bridge between, but she also is a complete advocate for the ASL community because she has grown up it in her in in it herself, even though she is not. Um, and then there's Austin, who is one of the love interests for Charlie in the story. And he is interesting because his family, I don't know if there's a word for it, but is essentially generationally has been deaf over generations and generations. Oh, wow. They are a family who has always, every member of their family has been deaf over years and years and years. And for them, it's not a handicap. It's not, it's something that they're actually proud of. They've, mm -hmm. they've thrived in, and, um, you know, they all, they all sign and it's just how they live and they're just completely happy with it. And actually there's a certain pride in it, like mm -hmm. to the point where when Austin suddenly has a baby sister who turns out to be hearing, it kind of really rocks their world. They're oh, like, wow. ah, mm -hmm. what now? So, and then there's Kayla, who's the um, Charlie's roommate and Kayla is black. And through Kayla, we learn something about um, black American sign language, which is different from ASL. And you get similar kinds of um, issues between, you know, what is standard and what is non-standard. And of course, black ASL came up because they were segregated. Black people, black deaf people were segregated into black deaf schools and their their language grew there. Mm -hmm. Is it an entirely separate language? Or <clears throat> it's it not entirely like separate. A, almost like a version of a dialect. It's, but it's, in... more, it's, it's in the same way that, you know, um, Black American English is, you know, understood to be a not a di well, I, is it is dialect the right word? Probably not quite the right word, but yes, it's a version and a version it's a legitimate. So there's, there's it's not overlap. Like, it's not like British Sign Language and American Sign Language where like they are right. It's totally different. British that's yeah, that's another yeah. thing. It's you know, these languages, they're full languages. We all think mm -hmm. of them as some, some sort of translation of English. Mm -hmm. They are not. English, British English. Sorry, British Sign Language and American Sign Language, as Casey said, are completely separate languages. Yes. Mm -hmm. In fact, ASL has more in common with French Sign Language um, because of its origins with Gallaudet, who was a Frenchman who came here to start that university, which is you know a deaf university. Mm -hmm. That I'll, I can talk more about that later. But anyway, so all of this stuff you are learning mm -hmm. through the characters in the book, as well as being told this story of Charlie, who is rebelling, who is walking into this new world where suddenly the language is opening up for her and you, know, you can imagine just being deprived of language for your whole life really and then suddenly it becomes available to you and all of the things that she learns and all the things that her parents haven't been able to tell her about about the deaf community because they don't know all of these things um and then along the way the author and i i don't want to get too bogged down in this but it's such a great part of the book um asl is is completely represented on the page in this book. Mm -hmm. So as you are reading, um, for instance, just a little thing, each chapter is from a different character's point of view. And you can see, I don't know if you can see on camera, but there's um, C yeah. for Charlie, right? So C is every, and when it's Austin's chapter, it's A, and when it's February's chapter, it's F. So um, there you see those. And then you see on the page of the dialogue, um, people, the way she puts the dialogue on the page, it's like person A talking, person B talking, and as if they are facing each other, right? Which you have to do when you're speaking because it's mm -hmm. all visual. Mm -hmm. So you see the you see the dialogue go down the page like this, oh. and it just gives you this sense of of people mm -hmm. having to look at each other when they talk. In the audiobook, you can hear the sounds of signing behind it, which is not as effective as seeing it because it right. is a visual thing. It's not yeah. a it's not an auditory thing, but it's still they tried to do something with the audiobook. Mm -hmm. I would recommend reading this one, not not listening. And then um, <clears throat> she gives little grammar lessons. So you know, put the cup on the table. We would say in English. In sign language, you show position first. You show the you show table, and then get forgive me if I get this wrong because I probably am. There's a there's a sign for cup, and then you show the cup on the table. So it goes table cup on. 
that's and so with that little you know it's like drawing a picture right mm -hmm. where what would you draw first in a picture you, you would draw the, the table mm -hmm. you would show yeah. the base yeah. right and then you would show the thing that's going and then this then what it's doing with it you know they would put them together so you just makes you understand um how signing works in in a completely different way um and how it is really a language in itself there's also more in the book about there's history about how asl came to be um there's there's also one about black asl um there's um uh idioms there's a whole thing about storytelling and how you use your body to tell a story um, so if, say, an adult is talking to a child and you're, you're representing that conversation, how you use your body, to, and when you're the adult speaking, you're, you might be looking down and being very animated that way. And then when you're the, when you're the child, you'd be looking up. Mm -hmm. And it's, so it's a very dramatic, very vibrant kind of... We were, when we were just in Disney, we watched one of those like live action, like yeah. Beauty and the Beast things. Yeah. <laughs> and they had um, people doing it in ASL. And, and yeah. one person was one character and one person was kind of the other character. Um, it was amazing. I was. I kept finding myself watching them. And not every show. time, yeah. so, every time, I, there's awesome. ASL interpreters for anything. Like even if it's the driest, you, like it's like a political world, talk. And I, am, I am watching them because yeah. it's so fascinating. It is. I'm like, it's, it's so you know, live as a hearing and... person. I can still hear. You know, whoever's You're still taking me, it in. But yeah. I like they do such an amazing job. Like yeah. it's really right. it's making really it great. a perform. Like making it a full body. It's a full body thing. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And it and. You know, again, just giving you this feeling that, you know, this is something that we we completely, as hearing people, it's easy to for us to just sort of discount because you think of it as some kind of translation or some kind of, I don't know. Anyway, it was, so what we're doing in this book, what she's doing in this book is t also telling you this great story of Charlie's kind of awakening. But the great thing, and, and what all of these things that you're learning as she sticks them in through the book, is you are having an awakening at the same time as Charlie is. And she, you're sort of riding the wave with Charlie, and you are, um, you know, you want to rebel when she wants to rebel, when she wants to, um, uh, she, de she decides that being deaf is something worth, worth fighting for. And you see it in small ways or I guess maybe may personal ways with her parents and the way she learns to become independent. And you see it in larger ways, more political ways, um, as she gets involved in the cochlear implant sort of debate and some things happen at the school and there's some, some kind of pretty big drama that happens in, in the plot that is all about her or kind of a, a more of a political awakening. And again, you're, you're right there along with her. So it's a it's a good story and and tons of things to learn and know in this book. So that's True Biz by Sarah Novich. Highly recommend. And I think we're <laughs> we're going now. We're to as, something terrifying. I'll say, as as we always do. <laughs> yeah. Totally switching gears. Um so the book that I have today is Trapped in Terror Bay. It is a nonfiction um young adult. It's solving the mystery of the lost Franklin expedition by Sigmund. I think it's Brower. It's B R O U W E R, um, and it is it is nonfiction. Um, it is the story of basically England's one of England's last expeditions to search for the Northwest Passage before um, they actually did find it. Mm -hmm. um, and it was there were two ships, um, the Erebus and the Terror. The man who led the expedition was John Franklin. He had had some mixed luck leading expeditions before that, but for political reasons, as things often were in the 1800s, he was chosen to lead this expedition. And um, basically, um, I mean, you can, you know, Wikipedia the story, you know, the story is the story, it's nonfiction. Um, but the whole idea is that the Erebus and Terror went up into the Northwest Passage and vanished. Um, and for a really long time, like literally to like 2014, they had no idea where the ships had ended up. The crews, they, they could follow certain things and at certain points they sent people after them even immediately after and they could pop, they found, you know, a grave here and some facts here and, um, but they could not find what had happened to the majority of the crews. Um, they still don't know what happened to the crew. They have found the ships, but they know for a fact that the crew, the, crew, the two crews, John Franklin died 
um, about a year into the expedition. And they know for a fact that the crews abandoned the ships because the ships were locked in ice because the ice had come in, it was still in, it never left, and they were stuck. Mm -hmm. um, so, so this particular book, there's a whole bunch of stories you can find on it. You know, you can find, this is probably the youngest one, but you can, there's adult books. Um, I know the book, The Wager is really popular right now. It's not the mm -hmm. same story, but if you like that, you'll like something about Erebus and Terror. Um, and what they, they have found the ships. Um, they are officially like England's given like custody of them to Canada because it's in Canadian waters. Um, there's been like, I think one public visit to one of the ships. Mm -hmm. Um, hilariously, they had pre-named two different bays, Terror and Erebus, after them, and that is basically where they found the ships. Oh, wow. wow. Um, but one of the fascinating things about it, because the thing I like about this book is it goes through the, the, the whole expedition, you know, kind of step by step of what we know. And then there's a second, there's a couple parts, you know, it's in the way of, if you've ever read, like, younger nonfiction, there's a lot of, let me find a page. There's a lot of like breakout boxes. So they talk a lot about the forensics that's been used to figure out what they figured out. Um, and then there's a whole section. So they do this, they do the expedition. There's the search immediately following it. And then there's the modern search for the ships and the crew. So there's like three parts to each chapter kind of talking about that segment. And then it moves on to like the next part of the expedition. Um, so it's a little, it can get a little confusing reading it this way, but it was also really interesting because, you know, you, you really got the, like, how everybody kind of looks at it. Um, but one of the most fascinating things about it is that the English for years and were like, we have no idea where they went. We have no idea where the ships were. And the Inuits up there were like, we do. We know exactly where they are. And the English were like, no, we don't know where they are. We can't possibly know where they are. And so finally... Um, you know, some of, you know, in the, in like the 2010s, people started to actually listen to the stories that had been passed down among the Inuit families and the Inuit, like their, their stories and went, oh, maybe, <laughs> maybe, they, maybe they know what they're talking about. And that's how they found the ships. Wow. Um, they were like, and, <laughs> but part of the reason why they, they weren't listening, I mean, other than the 1850s and England. Yeah. But part of the other reason that even for quite a while after that, they refused to listen to the Inuits is because the Inuits were like, so we ran into the crew when they got off the ship and like, yeah, there was probably some cannibalism and like, and of course, like, these were like English nobles we were talking about, like people right. of like stature. And so we could not slander them in such a way. So they were like, well, that can't like to the point where Charles Dickens wrote like articles about like discrediting the people who originally said well they turned cannibal and we think they all just died right like um and um it's fascinating too because it's it's this little microcosm of history but the way we learn history in school tends to be you're learning english history and then you're learning american history and you don't often get to step back and kind of look at the world at a whole at any point mm -hmm. in time so it was really interesting when I was reading this because then they were like, oh, well, we went to the American president and this is what was happening in America in the 1850s. And I was like, oh, yeah, well, it was like right before the Civil War <laughs> and like, you know, and, and then we threw Charles Dickens into the midst of it. And I was like, yes, they all lived at the same time, yeah. but you don't usually get them. You don't, yeah, usually, you don't usually get them. Like so that. it was yeah. it was really interesting. And um, I will also say um, just a, an anecdote is um, if you are a Jeopardy watcher um they're doing the jeopardy masters like the best of the best right now and i was visiting my mom last week and i don't watch it much because i don't have cable and i don't remember to watch it afterwards mm -hmm. but my mom turned it on so we were watching and we got to double jeopardy one of the two thousand dollar clues and it literally was like what was the name of the ship oh, wow. that was named <laughs> after darkness captained by John Franklin that was searching for the Northwest Passage. So like, of course I'm immediately like, I know, and you know, yelled out the name. And my mom was like, how, have, and none of them got it right. And I did. So I was very proud of it. Cause there I mean, go. obviously they would have kicked Timing. my butt in real life, but I knew that one, that no one else knew. Um, so yeah, it is, it is a funky little like side note because, you know, in school you hear about the ones that are successful, you know, you hear, and you hear about the, specifically the age of exploration and, yeah. you know, the people who were, or during that period. So it was interesting to look at what was kind of left towards the very end of that. Mm -hmm. And also like how often they, cause like the Airbus and Ter Terror, both of them had spent years down in the, in Antarctica, perfectly safe, made it all the way through, like did all sorts right. of stuff down there. There's, there's a, I think a volcano on Antarctica that's named like the Erebus because after the ship 
and then they came up here and it was it's really interesting to read about because they they do have quite a few letters and notes and stuff back from various points that they hit um to kind of see because they try and do a lot of firsthand mm. stuff in this um and to talk about you know where it went wrong and yeah. where it went right and they're big into maps which is great because i'm like i don't know all these little like they're talking well, about this straight in that island <laughs> um but yeah it is really interesting and as i said there's a bunch of different books on it um there's also a tv show um called the terror that was on a couple of years ago it's streaming on something i can't remember amazon prime maybe it is a supernatural there's also a book called the terror that it's a supernatural version of like this mm -hmm. so it like the, the the reason they never came back is for because there was Ghost. something stalking them yeah. not because right. they <laughs> ate each other yeah and the, you know the ice you know they just didn't survive the ice right um and but it also gets into a lot about surprisingly about things like the canning industry because that was just starting like this was one of the first expeditions that went out with canned food and how that's part of what killed them because things weren't canned properly oh. and so they literally all got like blood poisoning and stuff. And, yeah. yeah and all sorts of things and they couldn't figure out what was killing them so people started dying like really early so right. so yeah trapped in terror bay sigmund brower um it was it's it's a fun quick read um and it will help you in jeopardy there you go <laughs> good enough <laughs> all we need yep all we need. jackie um, I'm going to tease my beach reads list okay. with this. So, um, this is called Now You See Us. It is by, um, Bali Coward Jaswal. Um, she is best known, I think, for writing, um, erotic stories for Punjabi widows, which was like mm. 2017. It was a Reese's book club pick. Right. Um, it was very popular. All of her books take place in exotic locales. And this one is no different. This is right. Singapore. This is present day. And it centers around four Filipina domestic workers. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot of it's just kind of their day-to-day -day lives. And then the fallout that happens when one of this, this group um, is accused of murdering her employer. So the characters are really what make the story. Um, each woman is, is, you know, of course, got her own like, complex backstory. Um, there's Cora. She's the oldest. She's kind of matronly. She's the steady one. She's experienced. She's recently come back to Singapore after she um, kind of under some mysterious circumstances. She had gone back to the Philippines for um, a number of years to raise her nephew. And now she's come back. She's working for a new family. And she ends up being friendly with someone named Angel. Angel's also very experienced. She's a little bit younger. She's like, I think, in her 30s. Um, and she is in this kind of weird work situation where she'd been with a family for a long time. Um, the wife died. The husband is now older and um, has had a stroke. And so she's sort of shading into nurse territory and she's not quite qualified. So she's in a weird, kind of a weird place. Um, and then there's Donita, who is hilarious. And she's barely out of her teens. She's like 20, maybe 21. Um, she's just arrived in Singapore. She is placed. You kind of you get placed with families often on your initial um, arrival. Um, and she's placed with this woman, Mrs. Fan, and she's wretched. Um, she's, uh, they, they, she was described somewhere as notoriously fussy, but she's like beyond fussy. She's shaved into abusive. Um, and she just gets worse as the book goes on. And then these three end up kind of coming together when Floor, this, this fourth one with whom Angel is friends, the other two don't really know her. It's just this, um, well, this other woman, Angel, she's accused of, mar of, of murdering her boss. And the punishment in this case is death. So the, they're convinced she didn't do it, but the stakes are really high. So they're mm -hmm. all trying to see if they can somehow figure out what happened. Um, it's kind of funny because Floor is not especially fleshed out here. Right. There's only really, I think, one scene with her actually in it. It's all just sort of, she's just kind of the foil, I guess. She, it's, okay. not, it's not really, it, it's about her, but it's not. Um, and it's so when I, when I talk about it, it kind of I feel like it makes it sound like a mystery and it mm -hmm. is, but it isn't. <laughs> it, it isn't really. It's the whole book is about relationships. Right. There's um, the relationships of, you know, of these this group of women as friends. Um, Angel has had, had just come out of a relationship with another woman. So there's that. There's um, a, another Donita is seeing a, a boy from India 
And so they have these totally different backgrounds. And how does that play into um, their relationship? The, the employer-employee relationship is huge. There's a lot of um, kind of unpacking of that mm -hmm. and, and what's, what's appropriate and what's not appropriate because these people live in. I mean, you, mm -hmm. you, 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 yeah. are, you get like one Sunday off every other week and like you are like pretty much 24-7 on call. Um, there's an aunt and a nephew. And there's mothers and daughters. It's like every relationship, um, women-centric relationship that you can think of, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's covered here. Um, I almost felt like the plot was sort of immaterial. Um, I enjoyed it for the the real the kind of differentness yep. of it mm -hmm. of the setting. Um, I found this sort of behind the scenes look at their lives just fascinating and deeply heartbreaking. And their fortitude through it all is like it's so inspiring. Right. I mean, these people leave behind their families, often yep. their children, mm -hmm. their cultures, their language everything everything that they know and they come and they are just trying to make money and to send home to support their families and they're often gone for years mm -hmm. like years at a time um it's not like you can fly home for christmas mm -hmm. like it doesn't it doesn't work like that and the the government in singapore sort of <laughs> makes a pretense of trying to protect them mm -hmm. but it's really they're at the mercy of their employer mm -hmm. and, and Absolutely. they they all have experiences with bad and good and bad employers and it can really make or break you. And I mean, they're it's, it's really awful what they're subject, subjected to. They're tested for pregnancy like every six months mandatorily. If you get tested, if you're pregnant, like you just bought yourself a plane ticket home and you can't come back. Wow. Like it's it's really strict. <laughs> and it's the whole thing is just this life that we can't even begin to imagine. But in Singapore alone, there's like 250,000 Filipino oh, and it's not migrant just, workers. Right. It's not just Singapore. And it's I mean, not just Singapore. Exactly. I was, I was just reading um, Hala Alyan's Salt, Salt Houses, and mm -hmm. that's about um, a middle class Palestinian family who gets pushed out by the war and they end up in Kuwait, I think. And all of the middle class people there have the same, so the, same the setup. Memberships. Yep. Right. Memberships yep. live off Indonesian and yep. Filipino. Filipino yeah. workers. Yep. They knew tons on the ship and their contracts were terrible compared to ours. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it was it was a lot better than I think a lot of a lot of these poor people, but still, I mean it was years at a time and you didn't go home nope, and you, don't you go home. worked yeah. every single day. And you have children a lot of times that you don't even see. Yeah, it's oh, yeah, not this, just your you people, know, your other Yeah, people your... in this book who had left, I think it was four, I can't remember one one of them had children and it was just like, well, you know, you've left them home with an aunt and you hope for the best. And one of the uh, the angel's sister, I think, had been had ha something had happened in the Philippines and she had had some kind of job and she was doing really well. And then something happened, some, like a flood or something, and it, it all went badly. And they talk about her going. It's kind of a brief little aside, but they talk about her going to be a domestic in, in Saudi Arabia. Right. Which is. Apparently, I mean, the, the people yes. in this book are like horrified by that idea, by Saturday, yeah. which can only, you know, makes you wonder, like when you're reading this, it's hard enough to believe this. And yeah. if it's that much worse there. Yeah. yeah. And the, the, in London as well, the Saudi community has that same. Those people come there as well. There's, there's a big community there. Mm -hmm. So I found it to be a fast read I found it very worthwhile and if you really want to kind of get out of yourself for a little bit and mm -hmm. so that's sort of what my beach reads is going to be I'm calling it take me away <laughs> um, and they're all kind of books that are it's about the, it's the setting but it's also the the lives of the characters that are the kind of perspective like it's all that take you yeah like are just totally different but all bundled together it's not just it's not me you know going to Africa like it's, yes mm -hmm. it's it's the people's lives there right. um, so my whole list will be things in the vein mm. so your salt house book sounds like it could work actually yes salt houses could definitely work for your list I'll, I'll let you know. <laughs> in fact either of her books Ayan's books would work for your list so I mean in some ways that's what this book is like too it takes you into a completely different world yeah. even though it's here at home yeah it's um yeah so interesting so there you go a teaser for next months of beach reads when we will the three of us will all be back for sure oh no no Jack, Casey Casey summer sorry. reading will have started at that <laughs> point right. i do not leave the library where summer <laughs> reading has started so um but Jackie i will have a list i will, I will yes. have a list 
You and can pick up my list. At yes, the and there is a an in person program as well on June twenty. I will be there for that one. Second, which Casey will be there for. All of us will be there for. Um, and we hope to see you uh, either there at the library or back here with us next month uh, for our beach reads. And with that, we'll say goodbye. Thanks again. Bye.